Well, at the time I wrote Somewhere in Time, actually it wasn't called Somewhere in Time. The original title was Bid Time Return from a Shakespearean quote. My wife and children and I were on a camping trip and we stopped in Virginia City. In the opera house there I saw a photograph of Maud Adams, a famous American actress. And it was such a great photograph that creatively I fell in love with her. And I thought, well, what if uh, some guy did the same thing and could go back in time to see her? And then we were down in San Diego at the Coronado Hotel. And so I decided I would set the book there. I actually stayed at the Coronado Hotel while I wrote part one and imbued myself with I was the main character. I sold it right away. It didn't do that well. Steve and Simon, and now Steve and Deutsch at the, that time, fell in love with it. I went into a bookstore and picked up a copy of this wonderful book called Bid Time Return, written by this man that I had heard of, Richard Matheson, who'd written The Incredible Shrinking Man and other things. And I read this book and I was just enchanted. And something clicked inside of me and said, okay, I gotta make this book. So Richard and I had our first meeting in February or March of 1976, and we made a pact at that point that we would make the movie together. It took three years from that point forward until the time that we could actually do it. And then in 1978, my boss, Ray Stark, called me and said, there's this director named Jeannot Swark who just did Jaws 2 for Universal. We should figure out something to do with him. Just before Jaws 2 was released, I suddenly got a call from Ray Stark and he wanted a meeting, so I went to see him, and he said, we have a book here by Richard Matheson called Big Time Return, but nobody seems to really understand it. And I said, well, I'd like to read it. So I read it that night, and I called Steve the next day, and I said, this is it. I had an instant affinity for it. Matheson started working on the screenplay, but a lot of the people felt that the use of bid in the classical English sense, like bid time return, it would be obscure for some of the audience. It was not a very catchy title. Then we talked a lot about something with time, and I think it was Steve Simon who said, what about somewhere in time? And everybody went, that's it. My problem after Superman was that I was offered uh, many action hero roles, and that didn't really appeal to me. Uh, somebody seriously asked me to play Eric the Red, the Viking. I could just see myself with a silver cup with horns on my head. But action adventure wasn't really the, uh, what I was looking for. I was looking for something very quiet, something very different. And I was just struck by this very simple love story that had the unique aspect of time travel. And I thought, as long as we can make it believable about how the character goes back in time, as long as that doesn't seem to be too strange or unbelievable, then I think the movie would work really well. That was my only reservation. I waited a little while. You know, thinking about that, thinking if I could make that believable. And then I decided we should just go for it, you know, that uh, the notion of it was so magical that it would work. I became obsessed with this movie. I read it and I went, oh my gosh, this is the one. It just, it, it sang to me, it just, it, 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 it inhabited me, and it was the first time in my life that I just went, this isn't about wanting something, this is about being this character. This is, a, this is someone I know. I have to do this. I've always liked those sort of time, going through time, back in time pictures anyway. Uh, all the books that refer to that are some of my favorites. So the uh, subject matter attracted me enormously that, uh, one could play a character who was rather based on a famous theater manager and theater entrepreneur. He had a, he had a sort of soul and he had a romantic um, education. And so he had a romantic twist to his personality which made him a little bit more human than just simply being a kind of demigod of the theater. I did it for my grandson because the idea that I was going to work with Superman was, <laughs> you, you know, he was so excited about this. Like everyone, I think I fell in love with the story, the idea of going back in time. And it was, it just was so different than everything that was going on in films at the time. And when I got there and did it, actually, it was interesting that the whole company had seemed to come to it for the same reason. You know, they were 
enchanted by the story. When we finished making the movie, I asked Cheneau, who are you going to get for the music? And he said, oh, I don't know, we've got to find someone really good, but you know, budget-wise, we're not quite sure what we can get. And I suggested John Barry, and he looked at me in astonishment and said, are you crazy? We can't even afford to ask him. You know, it's, it's absurd. I mean, he's way too expensive. And I said, well, he's a very close friend of mine, and I'll give him a call. And Cheneau said, really? I said, yeah, why not? So I called him up, and I said, John, got to do this movie. It's just the most amazing movie. It's a wonderful story. Read it, please. Just see. I said, they can't afford you. They can't even afford to ask you. So this is just for me. Just see what you think. And he saw it, and he just said, I'll do it. There is no doubt that, I mean, this is one of those films where the music is a major contribution to the film. Once you write a theme like that, that hooks onto the real essence of what it is, then you can play with that theme. Then suddenly John Cohn said, what about Rachmaninoff, the theme or variation or theme of Paganini? And we tried it, and it was magic. It worked perfectly. I adore Mahler, but Rachmaninoff is la -di -a -da -di -dum, la -di -a -da -da -dum. There's movements. There's, there's what I term as cinematic movement in the music. When it suddenly became this cult classic, when, when it got onto videotape and just people were watching it and renting it and renting it and watching it on television, then everywhere I'd go, people would say, oh my God, Summer in Time, oh my God, that's my favorite movie ever. We'd put so much into the film that it was hard to see it get trashed in the beginning. And incredibly gratifying that over the years, our belief in it uh, really turned out to be justified. Ten years later, I suddenly, out of the blue, got a phone call by this wonderful man named Bill Shepard. I was probably one of the few people, relatively speaking, who first saw it in the theater when it came out in October of 1980. From the opening scene, I was blown away <laughs> by Somewhere in Time. It became my favorite movie, and I enjoyed talking about it to anybody who would listen to me. And occasionally I would run into people who had also seen it and their eyes would light up and they would say, yes, wasn't that a, a wonderful movie? I started thinking that there's something wrong here. There's all these people, uh, I'm convinced, who absolutely love this movie. Many people had told me it was their favorite movie of all time, and yet it uh, didn't really seem to have the reputation that it deserved. So I thought, well, why not uh, maybe get something formal organized? Why not start some kind of an organization? I put an ad in a movie magazine. I think the wording was something like, do you love the movie Somewhere in Time? And I would say within about two weeks, I'd received roughly 50 letters from all over the, the country. They all basically said, I was so surprised to see your ad. I thought I was the only one who loved that movie. They all, they all used that phrase, I thought I was the only one. And people were just coming out of the woodwork. And within a couple of years, we had about 1,600 members. We answer to the term fan club because I, I guess that's what we are, although we often use the term appreciation society. It sounds a, perhaps a bit more dignified, but our main vehicle for communication is our quarterly journal. Insight publishes an elegant quarterly 20-page journal, the most elaborate ever put out by a fan society, and 2000 is our 11th year. Somewhere in Time appeals to people in all walks of life, regardless of ethnic background, age, culture, or gender. In fact, fully 50% of the fans of Somewhere in Time are men. I first got the idea to do some kind of a Somewhere in Time celebration uh, when I contacted Grand Hotel, and I contacted their convention manager. He got back to me and said, you know, we like the movie Somewhere in Time too." and uh, rather than just you coming here for your convention, why don't we partner? We will put on a Somewhere in Time package weekend. They always bring 10 or 12 of the uh, celebrities, 10 or 12 of the people who made Somewhere in Time as our guests. People dress up. We have tours on the island of all the uh, locations that were uh, in the film, a costume, dinner dance, trivia contests, we have panel discussions with all the invited celebrities. It's really quite a magical weekend. 
I think people are only beginning to realize what a gem Somewhere in Time is. And I am delighted to welcome new fans or old ones who thought they were the only ones who loved this movie to our inside group. They're in for a lot of fun. I also want to say, first of all, that I share every um, moment that of, of what you give to me, I would like to share with our co-stars in the film, particularly Jane Seymour, whose portrait on the wall precipitated the action of the whole piece, Christopher Plummer, whose magnificent majesty as the manager lent such authority to the picture, and Bill Lerman and Susan French and everyone else all the way down to day players and I, I just am here representing all of them today. It happens to be me here but I want to share it with all of them. I went to the first three, you know, to make sure it got off the ground and a wonderful atmosphere. And it all happened spontaneously without any organization, without any studio backup. It was really the audience discovering the film. Usually if a movie opens and commercially disappears, it's gone forever. The spirit of this movie, the soul of this movie, the heart of this movie lived on until it could connect with people around the world. I feel very fortunate that in my career, um, I've been in a couple of movies that will always stand the test of time. And one of them is the first Superman film. And Somewhere in Time, which actually really is timeless. Of all the movies I've ever made, this is the one that I will never forget the experience of making it or the pride of having made it. And isn't it nice to know that something that didn't cost a lot that had everyone's creativity and enthusiasm and love put into it, that this little jewel not only still exists, but it still is brilliant and shines to new generations to come. That's what's exciting. I think just the fact that the film got made and that I spent those weeks with this extraordinary group of people in front and behind the camera this family, Verna, Steve, Chris, Jane, Lizzie, so many people. And we all shared in this. And on the island, where I shot the scene where Richard and Elise meet, there's a stone with a plaque that has been put in. This is where the characters of the film have met. I mean, it's extraordinary. It shows that the film has become something which is beyond all of us who did it. It has a life of its own and I had the honor and the privilege to be part of it. I think that's plenty for me. Oh. Oh.